Good afternoon, welcome to High Up on the East End uh, of the Valley, uh, where we're joined by a very special guest this afternoon, Charlton Athletics brand new owner, Mr. Thomas Sangar. Thomas, thank you for your time. This Thanks, Ali, I appreciate it. Um, we're going to get to know you a little bit better this afternoon. Obviously, we chatted before on Zoom, um, but we've got a bit more time now to, to sit about, to talk about all things Charlton and all things you really um I mean, first of all now you've got your feet under the table for a couple of weeks how have you enjoyed your first few days and weeks as, as charlton's owner well it's been uh accelerating it's exhausting uh but but it's very exciting i'm, I'm so happy i did this this is uh this is, this is going to be great obviously your, your first game officially as owner was the nil nil draw against Sunderland last weekend and well it was it was an point. improvement over the pro game yeah right? of course it's great to watch yeah Okay, um, well, we're going to go right back from the beginning now because we want to get to, to know you as a person uh, as well as a businessman and, a, and an owner. Um, so born in Denmark, obviously. Uh, was football a childhood pastime of yours? Where did, where did football really come into your life, if you like? Right, I think I was 11 or 12, uh, right around there when uh, Chelsea won the Europa Cup um, against Real Madrid. And that's when I became a fan of English football. Um, that was exciting. I, I believe that was a... Uh, my parents had a uh, black and white TV. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, at that time, those were the days. But uh, and then, obviously, I just like everybody else started started kicking the ball around. Uh, done that even before that, and um, and played up until I was eighteen or nineteen. And then obviously uh, other things uh, come in, and you're not a professional footballer yeah, yeah. at at that point. Then uh, <laughs> would that would that have been one of your first dreams to be to maybe play football or get involved in football some? So. Yeah, I mean it, 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 that's just something about football that that never leaves you once yeah. once, once you're bitten uh, by. Um, yeah, by the buck, yeah. yeah. And how were you as a player? A striker? I remember you saying yeah, yeah, on Twitter I'm, that you were a striker. Yeah, I'm, I'm a terrible defender, let's <laughs> put it that way. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm way, 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 way too offensive uh, thinking, <laughs> so oh, obviously it's, it's my goal that uh, we, 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 uh, we, we, we play offensive and, and exciting football. Yeah. Agree, brilliant. Um, and what about the business side of life? How did you progress into business? Where did that all begin for you to, to become a successful businessman? Yeah, first, first I got a degree in electrical engineering and um, had, had a short stint in the military as well. And so my first, my first uh, job um, was at a hearing aid manufacturer in the engineering department. And it turned out I had uh, the, the, a brand new technology all in, all in the year. Uh, in, in production in less than half time it was scheduled and it was brand new and I figured out this uh, maybe maybe engineering isn't for me and also I had started on, on getting myself an MBA and um, and as I uh, went through that education um, at the same time uh, I got a job at, at Siemens in the semiconductor department uh, found myself very quickly also coordinating all the the computer uh, demands for, for for the sales department as well, and um, relatively quickly uh, found myself in in the uh, global headquarters of, of the new cell phone uh, division that Philips had had built and was part of building distribution uh, all over the world, uh, mostly through Philips subsidiaries, but also uh, defining through the engineering departments what what new t features, etc., the new models of cell phones we were developing. And, um, and we've, we, we literally, uh, we were very successful, let's put it that way. Yeah. We beat Motorola and Nokia and those guys yeah. in, in most markets uh, back in those days. Um, after that, I, uh, I got a job as um, VP of marketing at a uh, company um, that was uh, doing uh, data communications. And again, we we basically knocked out even companies like IBM instead, etc. Et wow. Big hitters. Uh, yeah. So, very successful. I was part of setting up distribution uh, uh, around Europe. In that, um, my next job after that was at uh, ITT, an, an American company. I was there for eight years, and very quickly started working for their worldwide headquarters. And and again, consolidating organizations uh, throughout throughout the, uh, the the world. I was part of that. And um, I was a, a big portion of the time was in I was in Germany, and uh, had family back in in Denmark. So I moved back there and started working for a medical device company. Um, and after having worked there for 
for a couple of years uh, setting up distribution all over the world. I uh, got the opportunity to, to import devices from this medical ma device manufacturer to North America and I started importing devices uh, from other companies and that's when I started the company uh, Sinex Medical, which is a medical device company. And after a couple of years, I uh, started developing uh, a whole line of products that I had that I invented. I'm, I'm, I'm still coming up with with things uh, for for Sinex Medical today. Very now a very successful company on uh, listed on Nasdaq in in United States. And e even during COVID, our revenues are growing yeah. approximately 100% year over year, and we, we keep growing the organization. Brilliant. Um, you also set up the Sangard Foundation, um, which supports the efforts to decrease the habitual use of prescription drugs. Um, That's right. Yeah. Why, why was, was that something quite important to you to, to get involved with and to, and to help? Obviously, there's a big opioid crisis in the States and all that sort of stuff. Was that all part of it? It is a help? big opioid crisis because when I started the company, Sinex Medical, uh, <clears throat> that's primarily focused on pain management. Uh, there was no opioid crisis in the United States, but here the past half a decade or so, it's really popped its, its ugly head up. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I felt I could do more than, than just providing devices uh, to, to patients to, to minimize the use of opioids. Um, so I started a foundation to, to support. You know, so one of the things we do, we provide, uh, or I donate, so that we can provide uh, naloxone, for instance, that, that helps someone that is overdosing out of it and, and, and basically keeps them alive. Yeah. Uh, so we, we save more than, more than a life a day, uh, multiple lives every day, just a result of that. And, and also just getting help, help to getting the word out so that there's, there's a lot of shame associated with being a drug addict. And um, therefore, when people are admitted to the emergency room, they, they don't always tell the, the true story because yeah. they're, they're shameful. The family might be out in the waiting room and uh, <clears throat> so sometimes uh, people get mis misdiagnosed uh, and all that. So the more we can produce the shame associated with it, the, the better. So that's, that's very important to me as well. Um, something else that's important to you is the music as well. And I know that that plays its part in the Sangar Foundation as well and in setting, doing concerts and charity yeah, stuff yeah. and stuff like that. But um, what about the love of music for you? Where, where did that start? Obviously, you talked about football as an 11-year-old and watching right. that Chelsea, but what about football, what about music? Where I think I was about 13 years old, see my, my dad is very musical, my sister is very musical, and uh, it, I was watching my sister getting uh, piano lessons and getting a guitar and all that, and all I wanted to, was to be cool in school. <laughs> <laughs> so so I bought an electric <laughs> guitar and, and eventually joined a band, and um, a few years later you, you, you play in front of tens of thousands of people, and um, you, 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 you really get, get hooked into that. And uh, uh, I was probably, what was I, in my early, mid, mid-20s mid when girlfriend gets pregnant, you eventually get married, <laughs> and uh, suddenly music is not that cute, cool yeah, anymore. Yeah. So I had probably more than 35 years of not even listening to and playing music. So here in the, the later years, I uh, obviously took it, took it back up again, and I'm halfway through uh, recording an album in, in Los Angeles. Yeah, tell us about, what, what's the band called? Oh, I, I call it Guardian Angel. Yeah. And um, one of the things about it is obviously all the proceeds from the music, once I get the album out, will go 100% to, to the foundation to, to support uh, the efforts against the opioid epidemic. That's fantastic. And um, as far as your guitar playing goes, self-taught? Or did you have lessons when you were a Oh, I had a little bit of guitar lessons, but they were kind of useless. I don't even read sheet music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just Listen and go. Yeah, I mean, but that's what happened. I just put that thing out on, on Twitter okay. just uh, so, so that people could, <laughs> uh, could, could see that I actually listened to So I listened to a few renditions of uh, Valley Floyd Road. Then tried to figure it out. Yeah. It's kind of hard because it's like 20,000 people or more in the stadium <laughs> singing. See, what exactly are the notes? Yeah, well, uh, I guess if you look up Mull of Kintyre by... Um, that's, I just that's found that the other day. So you didn't know? Yeah, because there was a fan Paul letter. Paul McCartney. Yeah, yeah, there was a fan letter to me here at the stadium, and he sent me, uh, the, he wrote about that and even sent the, the sheet so that music, which I obviously can't read, yeah, but so now maybe read. I can just tune into that one, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I bet it'll be a lot easier yeah. to just pick out yeah. the last few notes. Well, make sure you do an update when you get the second verse and the chorus, and then, oh, yeah. uh, then we'll look it's forward like, to that. Um, the wonderful thing, is, I guess, is that all this stuff, the business, the music, the football, it all marries together, and... Yeah. Um, and we're left with 
Thomas Sangard, the rock star CEO. Yeah, I'm the left um, one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it's very clear that you're a very serious businessman who gets the job done, but, but right, you, see, you seem to do it with a smile, and, and that seems to be quite important to you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the main thing in life is, no matter what we do, just have fun with yeah. it. Sometimes you even get better results that way. Good, love that out outlook. Um, but you must have faced some pretty big challenges uh, in business during your time. How does completing the purchase of Charlton compare with some of those big challenges that you've had to face? Because it wasn't an easy, easy job to easy. complete the purchase. Was I mean, it, it, it was it, it was literally uh, exhausting because I was still dealing with so many different individuals uh, that one way or another, directly or indirectly, had their the hands in this whole thing. Um, so I would say the first half of that seven seven week uh, period there was probably more about finding out what's really going on and what what is it pe what are people's interests mm -hmm. in the club their personal interests well what, for some people it was more about the reputation than the money it, et cetera. it was it was a very um, very difficult puzzle to put put together so the last uh, three three or four weeks of it was was more just so okay so how how do we put it all together um, so exhausting. I mean, obviously, uh, I've been sleeping for seven weeks, uh, probably uh, four to five hours maximum a, a day, also because of, I needed to be awake at, uh, at European yeah, time. time uh, right, yeah. uh, but it was, it, it was exhausting, but exciting at, at the same time because you're making progress, so you could see that this, this is going to happen. Was it, was it always a case that, I mean, you were obviously so determined that you were going to get this done, you said you're a stubborn person. Was, was there any point where it did well, get it, really it, difficult and you just thought, if you just look yeah. back at uh, my music background, well, my, everybody else in my family is musical, maybe except for me. But when you're stubborn, you can go a long way, and that probably stuck with me uh, for, for the rest of my life. I just yeah. get things done. Okay, that's fantastic. Um, I mean, your first involvement, uh, the first time you were mentioned, was by Rich Cawley of the South London Press. Out right, of nowhere, yeah, we've got to give him credit for one. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about artists, that. But, yeah. but one afternoon, uh, we, I mean, even myself, just packing up, ready to leave, and then all of a sudden, it was all over Twitter. Um, when you mentioned that you had a conversation with a friend over in the States mm -hmm. about, and he, he, he asked that question to you, that have you thought about, I mean, what, what was the gap between that conversation and, and you, you know, putting, putting your name out there and showing an interest in? So the gap was, um, so I said, yeah, it would be a great idea. So he sent me uh, the phone number of a, an attorney working for a, a uh, an attorney firm here in London called Freshfields. Yeah. So I talked to uh, to Leo, uh, the uh, the attorney there, about this opportunity of south um, southwest of Manchester, mm -hmm. uh, a place called Wigan. And I, I remember Wigan well from when they won the FA Cup over yeah. Manchester yeah. City yeah. a few yeah. yeah a few years back, and it was like wow, this could be exciting. And now you're looking at the, that had some. Hong Kong owners that, that totally mismanaged the club, distant owners, mm. and was now uh, literally in administration. And I, I went through the whole process with them just to see where, where could this go and um, put in an offer and all that. And as we were going through all this, I was learning about, well, Wigan's not really a football town, it's a rugby town. Okay, the lowest away fan base of any, any clubs in, in the professional leagues, um, and then you learn about uh, what the, uh, the, the restrictions the EFL would, would be imposing on them. Uh, you, you saw they actually played well in the championship. They were in the middle of the league, right? Yeah, and it was only yeah, the 12-point deduction that, yeah. that, that brought them down. Uh, but now there would be all these restrictions. And I'm about building businesses or whatever I get, get involved with, or if it's music. I'm, I'm about creating and building something. And it's like, this, this is not going to be fun. This is going to be just about how can we save some money to to make it decent, to eventually turn it around to a decent business. So I started looking at other clubs, and, and the only club where all the check marks were really there, except for the, the thing with the ownership and all that, was Charlton. I mean, uh, you, you look at the fan base, one of the biggest in the country. It's, it's just, there, there was no doubt that the minute I, I started looking at other clubs, that Charlton was, was the right one. So the trick was to make sure we, we avoided administration yeah. for, uh, Charlton. And that was just a couple of days before it went there that finally got all well, the pieces together. I was going to ask, just how close were we to, the, to, to that cliff edge, obviously? Yeah, well, it was two or three or four days, yeah. I can't tell you, but it was in that range, yeah. less than a week. Yeah. Oh, scary, really, to think about. <laughs> but um, 
I mean, the other well, the other thing to remember is that you brought a football club at a very, very difficult time in the middle of a pandemic. Um, yeah. So there might be some that would say, like, why, why, why now? Why or was it just again that stubbornness and that? Uh, right, I'm stubborn. Once done? you decide, oh, once I decide to do something, I um, I don't stop until it's done. Yeah. So. I mean, was, was there ever a case of you might have been tempted to wait and see what other clubs were around, or once Charlton caught your eye, no. Charlton were the ones. No. It, it, it would have been it's uh, whether it was Coventry, Sunderland, uh, Derby, Swansea, or the other, the other clubs that that could be just as potential. Um, there, there, there was no doubt. So when when you when you find your interest in Charlton and you, you identify Charlton as your club, do you do a lot of time researching the history and and everything about the club? Is that all the sort of stuff that? Or was that had, had you already done that, which yeah. meant that you wanted to? So that was obviously part of. Yeah. Um, so the history I already knew about Charlton because yeah. I'm from Denmark, and that's that's a strong Danish connection, yeah. right? So I knew a lot about Charlton already, um, and and the players that that's played here. Um, but some a big part of that learning process came as I was negotiating. I was also learning. I was learning so much from the fans. The, the minute. We, we got the word out, which I had to do because none of the, 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 the uh, all of the ownership characters, none of them uh, took me seriously. There were already multiple attempts to try to buy the club from consortiums, from Australia, from, from the US, even here in England, et, et cetera. Uh, that there were a lot of people, so they didn't take me seriously. And that's why I, I got, contacted uh, Richard Corley and said, hey, uh, you know what? I'm, I'm actually interested. Can can you get the word out? So he did that, and then the whole Twitter thing followed after that. But from that point, that's really where I learned about the club with all the fans that contacted me with the personal stories, which all obviously taught me about the history of the club. And when when the club was chased out of the valley and eventually uh, came back, and all the efforts with with the valley party and all that 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 it took to 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 to, to bring this back. It, it sounds like that. Communication with the fans is something that has played a really big part in in your interest in the club. It it, it has, yeah. It, it has literally strengthened my my, my interest in the club. Uh, but I should also mention that the effort of the fans and and how powerful that I'm I'm, I'm sure that some of the urgency at the EFL, um, other than contact them, contacting them on a more formal basis and and having people that I that I work with, uh, also contacting the EFL. The, I wouldn't call it pressure, but, but the, um, the, the urgency and, and, and the messaging that this is important for this club, that, that was something that, that helped. And uh, for, when also when it came to, to some of the previous owners, uh, I'm, I'm sure the, uh, the, 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 the massive support from the supporters also make them, can, can, we, can we get this done now? So. Yeah. <laughs> they so they could they they could move on and and we could just move on with uh, with rebuilding the club. I bet I mean the EFL are probably quite pleased that we've been dealt with now because it was it was <laughs> yeah. such an ongoing process for months and months. And, months. and I was literally when I knew that we uh, I had the support from the EFL. Yeah. That, uh, I, I was emailing back to people that were emailing me, also putting putting messages out on uh, uh, on Twitter that. Uh, Basically, it said, "Hey, can we just calm down now? We, we, we there's no, we don't need them on our backs, yeah, right? Yeah, we, yeah. we need this. I'm sure it's going to be a day in the future where we, we need their support." Yeah. So, I mean, EFL were that that hurdle was done already, wasn't it? By the by the last week, right. by the last couple of weeks. Oh yeah, well, well, before so, that. Yeah. So I guess Roland du Chatelet was the last. The that, last that was the hurdle. last piece uh, yeah. that we needed to put in place. Yeah. I mean, have you have you discovered just how different the business of football is compared to? Any other business in in already just from, just from you know dealings with Roland and and ESI and all that kind of all that. Well, kind that of stuff. part is like you have very different personalities in in any industry and, and they negotiate in, in so many um, they, they all have different agendas. So I, I don't think that is different from most other businesses or industries. Mm. What's really different in this industry here is that uh, let's say an owner takes on a, a business whether they start it from scratch or buy it. Uh, and you know you sell your product to your customers, etc. And if if it goes bad, you're on the hook yourself for, or, or the, the the shareholder group is on the hook for if if you go bankrupt, and maybe the bank if you have bank loans, etc. In football, it's different because you have that piece. 
plus the fans you have a responsibility for. Uh, so you have a piece there that uh, you, you don't find anywhere else. Yeah, unique. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you're, you're the sole director of, of the football club, uh, as well as the yeah, owner. Let's keep it simple. And well, that's going to be my question. I mean, you, you said as well you want to be the CEO. Um, is that is it important to you to, to be hands on and to make sure you, you know what's going on on the ground and, and just is it that simpleness? Just keep it as simple yeah. as possible and then good things can happen. But usually when, I, when I'm able to keep things simple, um, you get better results. So it's simply from, from that perspective. Uh, of course, it would be more convenient if I just had someone uh, do that for me. But this is such a new industry for me that uh, I think I know what I need in the future once, once I, I feel the pain. Right. Myself, yeah. and get yeah. my hands dirty, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, then I know what we really need. Um, yeah. Making minor modifications to the organization now, uh, just to get it, get it ready. Uh, obviously, we have Lee Boyer, Steve Gallen, doing a great job for the here and now, just rebuilding the team that, that got decimated here in the spring. Uh, but then I'm also working on my 10-year plan uh, to make sure that in way less than 10 years we'll, we'll be playing consistently in the, the, the top, yeah. top half of the Premier League. Well, you mentioned Lee Bowyer and, and Steve Gallen there. It must have been a, a, quite a relief that you know, that was something you didn't need to worry about buying a football club. And then that, 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 that was one of my check marks already, early yeah. on. It's like, at least we don't have that one to worry yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a question I know a lot of fans have been wondering about is the, the training ground. We, we discussed about the lease, the 15-year lease of the training ground and the, and the mm. valley previously. Um, but do you have any, well, there has been long-standing plans to, to improve the training ground because it, there are a few licks of paint that are needed here and there. Um, is that something, are you responsible for that? Uh, or is Roland responsible for that? Or if things I, need fixing I, I, or I made updating? sure that that was part of what I, uh, what, which was hopefully what was enticing to Roland to get into the agreement that I took all the maintenance right. uh, under, under my wings because I wanted to make sure that we, we were not dependent on, on his financial goals and whether he was in the mood to support, support it over here or not. So I, I took that on so that we made sure that for the fans here at the stadium and at the training grounds, we made sure that we, we just keep, keep it up and, and hopefully improve it over time as well. Yeah, okay. Um, so obviously the, the last seven years, seven, eight years, actually before that, it's been a difficult time for the club. Yeah. Um, the way it's been run, the, the people that have been involved, I think that's fair to say. Um, is it almost better that there's a blueprint for how not to do things, if that makes sense, that, that you can not learn from but improve on and not make the same mistakes that... Maybe in, indirectly somehow. It, yeah. Of course that's helpful. Um, yet I tend to do things my own way, mm. and uh, that um, it, it usually works. Yeah. I, I get things done. Well, it seems to be working better already in <laughs> the first couple of weeks yeah, than it has been the last few years. Such, such a great atmosphere compared to when I when I watched the, came out and watched the first game against uh, Crystal Palace. Is that? I mean, you must you're obviously picking up on that. I mean, the, the, the mood of the fans, the mood of the club, the mood of yeah. the whole place Everywhere. has yeah. has really changed over the last couple of weeks. I mean. You know, we've, we've, we've lost a player, we've lost Macaulay Bond last week, but there wasn't that much um, but you know disappointment what, that, that in that. Was, that wasn't necessarily... I know he scored a goal last minute. Yeah, yeah. But, but, uh, <laughs> QPR, but that wasn't necessarily a bad thing because as, as far as I could tell, and, and I could see um, uh, Lee and Steve, they totally agreed with me that it, I couldn't really see him fit into to our strategy going forward. Yeah. So, so, of course, we, we did well financially on it, but, but more importantly, uh, that, that opened up a space for... Yeah. For, for the type of player that, that will uh, fit better in that position. Yeah, and I think that kind of proves the point of what I was saying in that in the, in the previous seven years, that sort of communication and explanation m might not have been there. It wouldn't have been palatable. There wouldn't have been a, a genuine um, reason for losing right. a player other than for the finances. But now we, we've, we've got someone like you in place. That That's right. Yeah, and even before I took, took over the, the, the club formally, uh, I, I've been talking to Steve and Lee about, could you please hold on to yeah. Alfie Dowdy? Uh, so all the, the noise that's coming from Celtic all the time, uh, they, they, they would it's just ignore. No. No, I'm, I'm glad we managed to, <laughs> yeah. to keep him here. He's are. a great talent. Of course. Um, uh, we, the, the problem we have at the moment as a club is, this, the only problem we have, if you can call it that, is this salary cap that we have to deal with yeah. in League One. Uh, that's a challenge, isn't it? For, for what yeah, of we course it's a do. challenge, but there's, there's also a bright side to it because 
this is Charleston. We're in League One, but if you are a player, and and this is the kind of salary that that uh, fits where you're at, but you're one of the better ones, and you have a choice. So where do you go? Well, Charlton is a play to go if you're playing League One football. So I think we still have a leg, leg up on the other the other clubs just because we're Charlton. I agree. Um, you've mentioned the fans already and how important they are to, to this football club and to you. Um, they are the club in many ways, I think, for any football club, but particularly for Charlton. Um, but at the moment, we, we can't have them in the ground, which is obviously a big talking point at the moment and quite a controversial one, I think it's fair to say, yeah. with everything going on. What's your opinion on that situation, bearing in mind you know, the Prime Minister is, is urging people to go to the cinema or, or go to the Royal Albert Hall or the O2 Arena that's going to reopen, but, yeah, I we, heard that. but we can't have people out. out we, had, we had a thousand people in here when we played Doncaster. And you know what? Just watching how it was all organised, this was probably one of the safest places to be in all of London. Um, so I'm a little perplexed by that. That suddenly that's that's taken away from the fans. Um, it, it creates a much better atmosphere for for the players as well. Uh, you want that excitement behind you when you you're playing your home games. Uh, so I. I hope that well before the season uh, season ends, that we at least have a few thousand people back in the stadium. And I guess, I mean, for us, I mean, we're in a slightly more fortunate position than that. We are, do have a bit of stability now, thanks to you. But there's dozens of clubs who aren't so lucky, and, and that could be the difference between a club existing or not existing at the end of the day. It could, and unfortunately, there might be more clubs that throughout this season, because of the missing ticket sales and and other other opportunities uh, that, that their financial situation brings them towards a, a level of administration. That would that'd be so sad. Yeah, of course. Um, but us as a club, we're, we're at the start of, of an exciting journey with you. Um, so hopefully those fans will be with us in person sooner rather than later. But for the moment, what would your message to the, the fans be? I mean, how can they keep supporting us and, 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 and the club and yourself during well, of course, time. you want to watch the games at Valley Pass. If, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, uh, cool. that, that's a no-brainer. We'll put the website on the bottom of that so you can... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do that. Um, but, uh, of, of, of course, with, with social media, et, et cetera, uh, it's a lot easier than, than many years ago to, to stay uh, up on, on the news and what's going on with the club um, and, and, and just be patient. I mean, it, it won't be many months and, and we'll be back in the stadium I bet uh, we'll have the stadium here for uh, as soon as we can get in here. I mean, is there going to be a? Um, you're going to get your guitar out on the centre circle and play Valley Forward Road once you've had to. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> if you carry the amp, I'll, I'll carry the guitar. <laughs> All right, that's the deal. I'll carry the amp. Okay. We'll, fi we'll find a drummer as well. We'll, I know a few. That'll be fine. Yeah. Um, I mean, just just finally, you spelled out your dream um, of of getting us back to the Premier League. Ch championship first, mm -hmm. Premier League, and eventually one day, the big dream is is European football. Um, just how determined are you? You said you're stubborn. We know you're determined, but how determined are you to make that happen? Well, let me tell you that I've, I've only been an owner of the club for a few days. I've already hired the technical director that's going to fill the gap and basically build the platform behind the scenes, behind what, what's happening on an everyday basis. But so that we become a club similar to uh, to a, an Arsenal, Chelsea, Tottenham, and all that. So I've hired uh, Jed Vardy, that uh, used to work for the Premier League, had a stand out in uh, at at Reading, um, and worked with FIFA and the FA, etc. He, he knows everybody in the world, and he knows how to get it done right. And um, I'm very stubborn, so I'll 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 be patient even if it takes more than two years to get into the Premier League. Yeah, I mean, so the, so the building blocks have already the started to be put in. The building blocks are already being put in place, yeah. Yeah, I mean, what, what's, I mean, obviously this season, we're talking about three to five year plan and a 10 year plan and then 12, 15 mm -hmm. for, for each part. Obviously this season, we are a bit behind because of our situation. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, there was an embargo until just a few days exactly. ago. So we, we're just now beginning to sign players and, and yeah. the other teams have been added for a few months. Right? Yeah. So. Uh, there's a bit of catching up to do, so, but uh, it definitely when we get to the winter or January transfer window, we'll if if we don't get everything completed now, we'll we'll be in good shape after January. Well, I guess that that word patience is key as well with, with the fans as well because because we are a little bit behind. If if we do have to play a bit of catch up, 
that's the important thing to remember. I mean, you, you saw the game against Sunderland. We, we pretty much played, played level with them, so I think it was a fair result. And uh, just a little improvement from here. And, and we'll, we'll be in the, at least in the top half, uh, I think, uh, come, come January. And then we'll see if the, the last final stretch can get us up into to at least playoff territory. I guess that's the wonderful thing about this division is that you can be anywhere uh, come Christmas and as long as you put a run together, which is unlike a lot of the other divisions. So let's hope we're in a position to do that. Um, I think all, all that's left to say is thank you, um, not only for your time, but for, for saving Charlton during, a, during this very difficult time. And um, we hope to see you here, or we know we're gonna, you're going to be here a lot, um, yeah, certainly more than some of our previous owners, which we'll be grateful for. And um, Yeah, it, I mean, I want to thank you and, and all the fans. I mean, the welcome I've, I've received has been amazing. Just the other day when we played Sunderland with the fireworks going <laughs> off and all that. It, it, you can't it, promise it, fireworks every game, but we'll yeah. do what we can. So there's, there's a mutual love here. Brilliant. Thomas, thank you very much. And uh, onwards and upwards, I think it's fair yeah, to say. Absolutely. Thank you. Brilliant.